Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Is it okay with the microphone? Okay. Wonderful. Um, so uh, I, I, I think I'm going to be very brief, and uh, I got to paint a picture of a very broad strokes so that you might even call it a, a polemic, but hopefully this will generate some uh, discussion. And uh, what I <coughs> tell you today is not necessarily what I think is the state at the moment of digital humanities, but I think those are things to come. Just briefly, you, you also mentioned my, my my scholarly vita. Um, this talk is kind of a journey through how I came into digital humanities. I got my scholarly literary education at Johns Hopkins, which is very known for extreme close reading. Then I moved into media studies, uh, the Kitlerian uh, fashion, which also is some kind of close reading model not necessarily of texts, but of technological artifacts. And then I couldn't, when I was in v Vienna, I couldn't ignore that there is something like digital humanities and distance reading. And uh, now I'm uh, also getting more and more into web development and see that uh, the way we are moving forward also in our culture is not, on, is not longer, no longer uh, concentrated on individual artifacts, texts, but on data sets. And this is basically the story that I want to tell you. Um, my talk con is going to consist of four parts. In the first part, I'm going to tell you something about the main concepts that I'm addressing, namely post-humanism and digital humanities. This is not a complete story of it, but what I think it is, or how I'm going to use it, then I try to explain why I think that digital humanities is part of the post-human discussion. Then I briefly will reflect on the relationship between scholars and data. And uh, at last, I want to give a solution how I, can, how I see this is going to work out in the long run. So it sounds long, but it's going to be short. So, when I uh, speak about post-humanism, I mostly mean uh, discussion from, from the US, or uh, that is, is primarily now uh, yeah, discussed in the US. Um, the most famous voice in this discussion is probably Catherine Hales, uh, who developed this or coined this concept to a certain degree in, with her book, How We Became Post-Human. And um, I mean, there are other branches, something like um, the question of animal studies. I'm not interested in that right now. Um, what I'm interested in is the question of uh, Catherine Hales, uh, who relates post-humanism to transhumanism, which basically means that we are in, in a historical moment where uh, the human being, with the help of te new technologies, starts a journey into transcendence, or might start a, German a journey into a form of transcendence, or even machines are able to transcend the abilities of the human being. Uh, there is, of course, this is not new. Uh, Post-human thinking has a long tradition. Most famous voices, most uh, famous authors in that regard are, of course, Nietzsche in his essay on truth and lie in a non-moral meaning, um, acknowledged that uh, basically, yeah, um, the human being, the human race is just a moment, a very a second in history and will disappear and not the center of culture or knowledge. And uh, Foucault also took up on this notion and uh, explain to us that man is only a recent invention. What I'm interested in here in this talk is, um, that would be my claim, that man is no longer the cognitive center of our culture. When we come from enlightenment culture, with, which I would argue less and less impacts us right now, um, man 
was the central processing unit of our culture, also as the cognitive entity. Um, there were not many other cognitive tools besides the human brain. This changes. We know computers have now the capacity to um, memorize much more than we can do, calculate faster and much more than we can do, and so on. Um, if you want to have a reference for this kind of yeah, traditional thought, uh, my thinking is highly uh, inspired by Manuel de Landa's uh, book, Born in the Age of Intelligent Machines, in which he tries to write a history of the development of warfare based on the materials and uh, the technological devices. And he kind of imagines a robot historian who's telling the story, and he tries to uh, tell the story from a decidedly non-human point of view. Okay, again, post-humanism, what I think it's important for us for our discussion is that mo man is no longer, or the human being is no longer the cognitive center of our culture. It's, it's not no longer the CPU, so to speak, that drives everything. Digital humanities, I don't want to give you a talk here on digital humanities. You know that partly all much better than I do. Um, but in my talk, I want to focus now on one very important aspect, namely that I think what differentiates digital humanities from, let's say, traditional forms of humanities is that scholarship is now based on digital data. We just saw wonderful examples on, for that. And uh, the last talk also <coughs> showed us that it's not only digital data, it's not only one text file, it's a lot of digital data. And this brings us <clears throat> in an interesting situation. Because uh, from that perspective, I would argue uh, digital humanities has a very post-human trait. Uh, with the help of computers, we are now able to process more data than we could ever process through our sensory or cognitive abilities. Well, that, in the last talk, we, we, we spoke about APIs and queries that we direct to APIs, and we can get a lot of information out of that. And the problem is actually with our uh, sensory, cognitive, and lifetime capabilities, we have no longer the ability to test it, to reread it or so. So um, this creates, I think, some kind of, I call it a paradox. Um, and uh, in allusion to the wonderful book by Catherine Hales, my mother is a computer person, you can say my mother was, was a computer. She means, what she means there, Catherine Hales, is that in the beginning of 20th century, being a computer was actually a job. There were human computers who did the calculations. And now we're actually in a situation where we become the typists for the computers. We're, to a certain degree, and everybody who did TI encodings probably felt like that sometimes, at least I did, I felt like a preprocessor for the computer system. So, and what happened there when we do all our research projects is that we create data that we no longer process. I mean, we don't write a TI or create a TI encoded um, document in order to reread it or for an audience that reads it. The audience only reads the computer process rendering of that document. So um, what we actually do is we're, we're, we're functioning as an interface, creating data so that computer can deal with the data, can do things with the data. Um, so this sounds perhaps a little bit dystopian, but it, of course it opens up a lot of new possibilities. Uh, the good thing is machine, machine communication is much more efficient than much, much faster than human communication. The transmission of 
binary data is, of course, much, much sm uh, quicker than we ever could read or write a text. And this also means the advantage of when digital, the big advantage of digital humanities, or at least one big advantage of digital humanities is that we have a completely new dimension of accessible data that the study of individual documents, items, can no longer the primary focus of our research projects. This means, and uh, that's the reason why I mentioned that I come from a close reading uh, tradition, um, I work completely different, but I think in, in, in light of these innovations, these developments, we need to at least partly think about what we do in scholarship in different ways. Namely, no longer as, as a searching, an interpretation, a creation of meaning, but to a certain degree, it, is, it becomes a navigation through data. And that, I think, is a crucial point where we need interfaces. Um, we had a lot of examples now showing how to render individual texts. And I think this is, of course, an obviously important task of interface creation in the digital humanities. But I also would argue that it's important to create interfaces that help us to, in, uh, to navigate more intuitively through uh, these vast amounts of data that we have right now. Um, due to the short time, I cannot elaborate that, but an idea that I find very helpful is uh, Sibylle Krema. She is a German philosopher, and she thought about a lot about the operational uh, functions of writing, uh, of mathematical writing, but also of um, alphabetic writing. And she um, works a lot with the, um, uh, the term diagrammatics. That basically means that you have um, structures that organize data and um, knowledge. And um, how can that look like? Give me, I give you as a conclusion, a brief example of how that could um, look like or what I actually mean by navigating through data. There is this great, great web page slash web service chorus search that um, brings together a lot of um, correspondences that are uh, yeah, on the internet in editions uh, and not only. And when you do queries there, you get a list, a wonderful, very helpful list. I don't want to criticize this work. I love this web page um, of um, data. You get, let's see, a search for somebody. And you can do a lot of different things here. I always like Bach because you get a lot of data. And uh, now you have a couple of days work ahead of you. Uh, but perhaps you don't want to do that. You don't want to read all the letters. But um, what Curve Search does, it gives you an API um, with a lot of helpful data, like uh, who sends one letter to whom. And uh, so you have a lot of, and I think, it's, it's more and more important to look at the metadata, metadata um, that gives you information about the relationships of the data. And now is the question, how do we map them? Um, there are probably a thousand here among you can do that better than I, but I uh, played around with this API and created a little um, interface, you might say, um, that um, where you can select one of the authors or senders in this respect, and that gives you a little graph to which uh, uh, Bach uh, wrote letters. Um, there are problems still there, and, but this is an example of what I mean, what we, I think, need now in our interface design. We do, don't on, do not only need interfaces that render the data that we have of individual objects, but we also need more and more interfaces that create um, the ability to navigate 
through these um, yeah, data-rich uh, collections. Um, so, my conclusion, um, to end on a dystopian note, um, uh, yeah, I had, I had to remove, for, due to copyright issues, the Borg. Um, no, I, I, I think there is no doubt that we have more and more and more and more data accessible to us. This accessibility also means that we have less and less direct accessibility. I mean, that we cannot really access all the individual texts that we could have access to. Uh, that means we cannot conceive them anymore as indiv individual aesthetic items, but as part of a set of data, as a network of data, of a network of items. And uh, I think it's more and more important to construct interfaces that do precisely that, help us to navigate along with the machine. Thank you very much.